I'm gonna be honest, I was planning on starting this video with some cliche hyper coasters or some of the most beloved coasters out there type beat, but then I stopped. I stopped because at this point, it's kind of hard to group together hyper coasters into just one category, like they're all the same thing, because they're really just not. Over the years, hypercoasters have evolved into a state that's almost unrecognizable from its original version. They got inversions now, they're not even fully made out of steel, they got weird seating, it's a whole mess. For me, I'm restricting hypercoasters to classic sit-down coasters that are in the 200 to 300 foot height range or have a drop that's in that range. They use a lift hill and they got a big drop to start it off. Anything that fits that criteria is a hyper to me. So no, I'm not counting 200 foot dive coasters or 200 foot launch coasters. I mean, come on, you, you know what a hyper is, just bear with me here, will ya? But I want to examine how we got to this point because obviously we didn't go from Magnum XL 200 straight to Steel Curtain. There was clearly some evolution in between. So today, me and WNY Coasters are going to be examining the evolution of hyper coasters. Let's start from the beginning. The first hyper coaster was Magnum XL 200 and none other than Cedar Point, the roller coaster capital of the world. This was probably Arrow's finest creation and it's an iconic coaster around the world. What can I really say about Magnum that hasn't already been said? It made Cedar Point a force to be reckoned with and showed people the power of airtime. <laughs> God damn, that really sounds like the title for one of my videos. Anyways, but I want to talk about the impact of this coaster because I really think it was a major coaster that started the infamous Coaster Wars. Before this, yeah, you had some parks that having their little pissing competitions for height records like BG Dub with Loch Ness Monster and again Cedar Point with Gemini, but none of them were as bold or eye catching as Magnum. This opened the door for more hypers, and hypers are still around today and thriving. Some look like a modern version of Magnum with smoother edges, rounder hills, steeper drops, while others are almost completely unrecognizable. Magnum was quite possibly the most influential coaster ever to be built. I'm not saying that we wouldn't have hypers without it because I'd imagine eventually we'd reach 200 feet on another coaster in one way or another, but I think it probably would have been a multi-looper or a bigger version of Viper or something. Viper XL 200. That would not have been the prettiest sight. So we can thank Magnum for giving us airtime-driven hypers we have today. Again, at the time, most coasters were focused on inversions. This really was one of the few massive additions that focused solely on airtime. So thank you, Magnum. You have my seal of approval. Magnum Spark, a small militia of wannabes at various different parks. At first, it was just Arrow playing their own game. Parks essentially asked Arrow to just build them a worse version of Magnum. This sparked Desperado at Buffalo Bills, Big One at Blackpool Pleasure Beach, and Steel Phantom at Kennywood. Both Desperado and Steel Phantom have terrible reputations of being horribly rough, and Steel Phantom was even overhauled to the much better Phantom's Revenge. I've heard Big One at Blackpool is alright, though nothing to write home about. None of these Arrow Hypers really came close to the level of Magnum, and no Hyper really would for a while. The next chapter was Morgan. They tried their hand at the Hyper multiple times with varying levels of success. Like WMI previously mentioned, they did make a major improvement to Steel Phantom with the now beloved Phantom's Revenge. This acts the inversions in favor of those demonic ejector hills at the end that everyone raves about. However, most of their other attempts weren't nearly as good. Actually, they're quite the opposite. They're really just not liked at all. I haven't personally ridden any of them, but looking at them, it's kind of just unimpressive. They kind of make me bored, just like, like, look at that, come on. Other people say they're no bueno, and they don't really look good at all, so I'll take the word of most of the community and say these aren't good. The rides I am talking about are Steel Force, Mamba, and Wild One. These are three of the four forgotten Cedar Fair parks, and while they serve as big rides to intimidate, I mean, come on. This is basically just Magnum, but worse. It looks like if Dorney looked at Magnum and was like, I want that, and this is what they got. Th this is Magnum at home. But this hyper run was pretty short-lived due to the quality of these three. I will say I've heard great things about Steel Eel, and I mean, just looking at the POV, like, this man is in his seat less than he is in, but that's not technically a hyper, so I'd say Morgan's hyper run was short-lived and not very successful. They did kind of come back with chance rides with the Hyper GTX, but that also hasn't been too successful with only one, maybe two being sold, and we'll have to see about that second one. But almost as quickly as Morgan was knocked out, another competitor came in. Intamin. Intamin has been building hypers from 1999 with their first ride of Steel Clone all the way up until today. Technically there's our mega coasters, but that term includes coasters from 100 to 200 feet. So for this video, we'll be referring only to the hypers or the ones between 200 and 300 feet tall. They started off strong with the three Superman rides, two of which being clones. These have large helixes and strong ejector moments, but they both 
would be overshadowed by Superman the Ride at Six Flags New England, which is considered one of the best steel coasters to this day. The layout consists of an out and back section with a twister section, unlike anything we'd really seen on Hypers thus far. But this is where it gets tricky, because for the first time in the Hyper Coaster history, there are two major players building Hypers at once. The other player was B&M. B&M is the most successful builder of Hypers with close to 20 being built around the world. B&M built Apollo's Chariot the same year Intamin built the first Ride of Steel clone in 1999. B&M Hypers, much like Intamin Hypers, had very smooth hills delivering strong airtime. Apollo was massively successful and more B&M Hypers went up. In the next 10 years, there were 5 B&M Hypers built, basically every other year. Those Hypers were Apollo, Behemoth, Diamondback, Goliath, and Nitro, and Raging Bull. I don't know why I said and twice. In the same time frame, Intamin only built 3 Hyper Coasters, although they did build a couple Mega Coasters with Exodus and G-Force, Goliath, and Thunder Dolphin in that time period. B&M dipped their toe into the mega market with Hollywood Dream and Goliath in those 10 years, but never really took off with it. They only really built one more with a flight of the Himalayan Eagle. But it was in the 2010s when B&M really went all in on this model. From 2010 to 2019, they built Intimidator, Mako, Shambhala, and the SBNO Hyper at Hotgo Dreamworld. They also built some gay coasters which used the same design as their Hypers with Leviathan and Fury. And like Costumes previously mentioned, they built Flight of the Himalayan Eagle in 2019. Intamin began to fall behind in this time period, only building Coaster through the Clouds and Hyperion in this time period. Hyperion marked the start of the new generation of Hyper Coasters, but that's for the next video. That's just going to about do it for this one. Be sure to be on the lookout for part two on WMI Coasters channel about the future of Hyper Coasters. Go check it out if it's up right now. I don't know. I hope you like the video and thank you for watching.